we are very pleased to be bringing you this complimentary presentation and we are very happy to see you here today. For those of you who are new to us, Engineerica specializes in academic center management systems for higher education. Uh, you may be familiar with our software applications including AccuTrack, Accudemia, or AccuCampus, um, and I do want to give a special welcome to any Engineerica clients joining us today. And for those of you who are not yet clients, I do want to let you know that we are offering a complimentary trial of our most popular center management system, Academia. Uh, this gives you the opportunity to use Academia for an entire semester risk-free to see if it helps make management of your center and data collection easier. If you're interested, uh, you can send me an email that's at rachelc at engineerica.com. That's R-A-C-H-E-L-C at E-N-G-I-N-E-E-R-I-C-A dot com. We started this keynote series for our clients and contacts who want to learn more about best practices and trends in higher education. Uh, each month we feature a distinguished speaker to talk about hot topics in the academic support field. Um, and next month's speaker is going to be uh, Geoff Bailey, who is going to be talking about um, fund finding new revenue, uh, new sources for funding uh, for your learning center. And we will make an announcement uh, through email and social media when registration opens for that. So uh, keep an eye on your email for that. So a quick introduction to uh, myself, uh, your host uh, for the day. I'm Rachel Cook. I'm a client success manager with Engineerica. I was previously a learning center manager for six years. So like you all, I am very passionate about higher education student success. Um, and I also have me, with me Nick Armstrong, one of our technical support specialists. Um, and he is uh, here as my backup and also to help with any technical questions that might come up. Um, with that said, I am pleased to introduce you to this month's speaker. Dr. Barbara Hong is currently the Dean of University College at Texas A&M International University and regularly consults with universities across the country on helping at-risk students become successful in college. She obtained her PhD from Columbia University in special education in addition to three masters as a learning specialist. Dr. Hong has been a professor for over 20 years and has taught in New York, Hawaii, Pennsylvania, Qatar, Turkey, and Texas. Texas. She is a recipient of the International Teacher of Honor and the University Exemplary, Exemplary Faculty Awards. We are so excited to have her here today. Uh, thank you for joining us, Dr. Hong. Please take it away. Okay. Everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Thank you. So your slide is still showing. Is it going to switch out or do I just close it? Let me, uh, we just made you the presenter, so you should be able to share your screen now. Okay, we're all good seeing my screen. I just want to encourage you guys to take notes uh, because uh, again, uh, when they post the slides, some things will be blurred and you may not be able to see because again, sensitive nature of talking about at-risk students. We have a lot to get through today, so I may not get through everything, but it's okay. Uh, if you have questions, post it. Okay, let's begin. And uh, when we talk about at-risk students, a lot of time we go, you know what? There are three truths that every institution uh, faces, okay? We all have limited resources. So, well, I could only do more if you, da, da, da. Or, you know what? We all are facing decreasing enrollment because of pandemic, all of this thing, and we're all under pressure. we got limited resources, but we are to increase en enrollment, right? And then we have also a new group. Well, they're not technically new. They're coming in, but at a at a full fledged. Typically, at my institution, we have about 50 students who are taking remedial classes in reading, writing, and math. And over the pandemic, we have grown by 926%. We are at 513 students who have not passed their entrance exam to be college ready. So terms that I use that are relevant in Texas uh, may be similar to what you have. We use uh, developmental education as the term, and so you might call it remedial classes, but one way or another, uh, there is a big you know, a group of students coming in, they are underprepared and uh, not college ready. And also whether or not they accept SAT, whether they even do SAT. But regardless of the pandemic or not, every students always existed. Oh, let me click this thing, okay. And sometimes they come in knowing, hey, I got accepted into college. I should, you know, know all this stuff and not identify myself. And the term is the imposter syndrome. But no matter what syndrome you have, the typical questions that is asked is, who am I, right? Can I do this? Why am I doing this? 
like golly why did i get into more education it's studying and struggling for me why am i doing it and do i belong here as in the institution or in college or in the major however they interpret this all the students ask these questions now let's examine what we already know when we talk about at risk as in at risk factors students who come in with lower entrance scores typically with or without the pandemic they have weaker reading writing problem solving thinking skills they are usually you know worried about borrowing uh, or being a heavy financial burden just to be the one in college oftentimes the first gen that means uh, they have no role models what is expected what am i supposed to do i'm supposed to go to college but who else and the people around me who do i talk to they could be working full-time while in college have a disability of different uh, kinds uh, on probation suspension or coming back to school uh, lacking motivation it's just the next routine but i don't really want to read or write but i'm supposed to go to college or oftentimes they transfer from one colleges to another or coming from community colleges these are the typical risk factors that we know right so we set aside oh well, how many can that be so then we build a system in there called the early alert if they have problems let's see you know what do you do and as institution you know uh, professors and as administrator why is it that early alert doesn't always work is a, a, a platform in place to try to reach at risk student professors submit for two same reasons one students are not coming to class two they are missing assignments those are the reasons professors often will ask um why aren't you coming to class or why aren't you coming to my class why aren't you handing in your work and the typical answer is if you're lucky that the student communicate with you right is that i don't know uh, i'm sorry i will try i will try harder i'm going to drop the class so some of these responses is expected and yet we continue doing it because we don't have any other way to reach at risk students so the common thing is students avoid because they're embarrassed you know they're uncommunicating uh, not communicating with the professor or thinking that college is not for me so i'm going to drop drop out of college not just this class so that i won't be your problem anymore and you won't get a bad evaluation so don't worry they consult some kind of lie maybe you know thinking that they must come up with a reason i don't know i must do some confession my car broke someone died i have to attend the thing so it doesn't really work because all it does is put two people or two groups on the spot for what is it that we could have or done to prevent or to understand that's what we're trying to do here so let's find out who exactly are our at-risk student other than the typical group so I'm going to share with you from my institution what are some questions that we asked and also to know that in Texas A&M International about 90 percent are Hispanic and 55 percent are first generation college students so that's the population that I'm asking who are our at-risk students a lot of them they are seldom heard or identified they are often hidden within campus they are not the one out there protesting joining a club being the leader right um, they are also blanket intervention just go tutoring go talk to a counselor for any kind of condition there's really no concrete data on what worked, what didn't work and we continue the same thing and whether or not we blame the professor not being qualified or there are so many dimension is the conversation is often not there and all we do is we say we have all of these services pick one everything something in here something got to help you or we say you know what if we pay your tuition that's it we take away the risk factor does it really do that or if they go tutoring that's it why is it that you go tutoring and you still didn't pass so you know it didn't work but do we really know whether or not that was a direct impact so we basically throw everyone a bunch of support without knowing if they work we do not track enough specifically which i'm going to talk about today and a lot of these programs are built for average student who knows how to advocate for themselves who knows how to reach out to those things 
So any students whom I have reinstated so far, every time they come in here crying, including yesterday, a student crying with a 0.0, .0 GPA crying, actually failing all classes, is that a lot of time they are not the one that go use the services. So how do you reach them, the ones that actually need the services? So instead of asking, you know, uh, what kind of services is to ask who are they before what services they need? Who are they? What is the profile of an average student in your group, in your age group, in your program, uh, in your department? Their field of study, are they undeclared? Did they transfer from somewhere? Are they dual enrollment, returning? The gender makes a difference on the services, traditional, non-traditional students. Do they add, drop, withdraw, repeating the course, enroll without the prerequisite that they need? Do they register for too few or too many credits? And uh, basically not affirm, that means they get accepted into college, but they're not affirm and accepted into their major yet. They often think it's the same thing. If I'm accepted into university, I must be accepted into nursing or education as well which has different criteria. So today, one of the biggest thing is to look at what does it mean by being intentional? It's your time, limited resources, but we all face the same time. So one of the key thing is identifying it as an inverted triangle, looking at your population. So if you were to separate, that means the highest group should need the most time. You do not need to serve 10,000 students, but you need to identify which group it is that you need to concentrate on, on this intervention. And if it works for your most at-risk group, it's likely going to work for your yellow and your green group. So in other words, such as by the time they are freshmen and they have less than 2.5 GPA, on an average scale, if they were to take four or five classes on an average C, that means by the second semester, if they have a 2.5 and they get one F, they are already at 2.0, right? So you got to be proactive and see freshmen who are at 2.5 are at risk of going to probation. Of course, those students who are entering below average SAT, ACT scores or requiring remedial classes, those who are coming in probation, provisional acceptance, they are in suspension. Those obviously receive early alert, good standing, but then they are afraid or don't know how to take advantage of services. They could be in your at-risk group. Students with disability, um, those who have D, F, W or W, F, fail, withdraw because they are failing. F, N, they fail because they didn't come to class. They use the state withdrawal by the first semester. That means, okay, there is something here. So within the institution, what is your typical pattern? Is it typical that 50 or 70% of them often drop a first class? What kind of classes are they dropping? Core classes or their major classes? If they are doing something that is different in the foundation classes, it could tell you maybe they're not sure if this is their major. Students who receive a C minus by the midterm, halfway through, are your warning flag right there. They are repeating classes. How many professor in a class of whether it's 20 or 100 knows that five kids are taking this for the first time? They often don't know unless the students speak up. Or they add drop twice within the semester. That means they drop in at, at the you know at, uh, add drop deadline, but then they also withdrew again, they change again, even if they have to forfeit the money is there is a red flag right there. Working more than 20 hours, uh, transferring from community college, or they basically come in, I don't know what is it I'm going to study. I don't know yet if I'm going to be accepted. I want to change something. So all of these are kind of interrelated, but they have different needs. And then now you go, hey, if you are your first semester or you're maintaining between 2.5, but less than 3.2, you're doing okay. You're not failing. You are, you know, in the B, C group, there are four checkpoints. Basically, we have every advisors, tutors being very cognizant by your at drop deadline. How are you doing? Uh, before your midterm, how are you doing? Three quarter of the way. So students could be checking on that themselves. And then before your final exam. So they're like, OK, I'm a BC. I'm going to make it. And then there are some students who just say, you know what? Leave me alone. OK, I know exactly what I'm doing. 
I know what I'm going. So in other words is separate your time so that the most of time is in the red zone area. Again, back to the word intentional. It's the same as being proactive. I intentionally look for this group. And the word intentional is done on purpose, right? Very deliberate. What is the purpose? So first of all, throwing in a big blanket or a big net and try to catch them, you may or may not catch them. There could be loophole or, or an experience. We're also busy. We're trying to look out for errors. But what are the data telling you? So let the data speak to you, which is a very big thing. And I do a lot of restructuring. Oftentimes, the administration will tell me, well, we want to fix this, fix this, and fix that, and introduce this, and implement this. I go, well, first of all, where is your baseline? What is the data speaking to you about? If you don't know where you are, you wouldn't know where you have arrived, even if you have arrived, and what the impact. So I'm going to take a glimpse of an example of the latest data that I just got yesterday, actually. A profile of transfer student. Maybe in my school, yes, my school is considered at risk. Or maybe I don't know if they're at risk, but I want to study them. So I have somebody pull out, give me a profile of the student. They're freshmen come in, okay? So some of them transfer a few credits, some, you know, here and there, sophomore, junior, very few senior transferring. They are often doing okay, you know, uh, between 2.6 and 3.0 is about, you know, look at their GPA. They are doing fine. So are they really at risk? They transfer about 60 hours, uh, but uh, 83 of them are not college ready. That means they are reading, writing, and math. Are, they are struggling. They're taking remedial classes. I have 20 of those foreign students. That means they may not know services or the terms that are being used in colleges. So, for example, I did a survey of, um, when I first came here, right, with no data. And I said, well, students, um, what are office hour? And the student go, office hour means you don't disturb the professor because they are working. And I say, OK, that's the understanding. So what are tutoring? What's tutoring? Oh, we cannot afford tutoring. So we don't go tutoring. OK, then I go, uh, what are academic success coach, meaning their advisors? They say, oh, we don't play sports, so we don't have coaches. So terms that we use are not the terms that they use or familiar with in high, high school, let alone a foreign country. We use the word credit. The associate with credit card is something bad. Do I borrow? Do I not? They don't see as school credit, credit hours that you want to earn, right? So be very mindful that in all of your profiling or restructuring services through the eye of the student and an international student, take your worst case scenario or your most foreign student, would they understand? And if they do, universal design is the larger group would understand. So in here, I see that 90% came from a particular college that are transfer here. And I also know that in my case is that they are mostly uh, athletics. Now, then I go further, transfer student who entered the institution since 2016 and have not graduated. How is it that they have not? Look at where they are stuck in their junior year when they're taking 3,000 level classes. Right. And it tells me that the average GPA they came in is decent. It's almost three. And the average transfer hours is 75. But how is it that they have maxed up 247 hours? It's average 120 credits. Right. Unless you are like some science, like engineering, maybe 131 credits. So I go, OK, this looks like what is going on. Your your first thought could be. Um, they are changing major. They may come in thinking that, wow, all of these credits are they not used? These are transfer credits. That means they can transfer their use, but they change their major. And the minimum is they transfer three hours. So on an average, it's way too many. They are changing their major or they are not seeking their advices or using career services. And I also have this data broken down by their major to know where they are mostly coming in as and then did it shift. So then the support for the classes needs to go there. Otherwise, the bottleneck is right there at the junior year and they are not moving on to senior to graduate. So are my support services and tutoring targeting those 3,000 level classes?
So that's just an example of what to look at. And also in order to reduce the junior year number, I must look at, well, freshmen, I have a decent 400, 400 over students. Do they already know those services right from the beginning? If they don't, then that's how the bottleneck comes in at a junior, right? It's just gonna leave. So then the next intentional thing is intentional programming. So I started this in the summer, just this summer, calling all new TAMU students. If you were to use the word transferring, re returning, you know, uh, dual enrollment, they may not be familiar with that, but I put that in the tiny print if they hear these words, right? Transfer do. But I'm calling you, become a successful student from the start. And all you do is scan this code. So whatever you do intentional, you want to get an action. Just scan this and so there's a thing at the bottom there which I deleted. It's a telephone number that they reach. And I also built what is it that they need to understand to be successful in college? It's a syllabus. So I have a ACE transition syllabus. It's a program. It's for two weeks, basically five and five hours. And I put it in the form of a syllabus for them to sign out. This is voluntary for them. So what does it cover? Topics include affirming your field of study, developing time management and study skills, cultivating a sense of belonging, and managing social emotional stress while learning how to access. So this is what this course is. By the word of mouth of whatever it is that the, the students pass on to their friends, is some of the most powerful uh, tool. And this also include hey, taking online classes. They have been relaxed and taking classes in their pajamas and all of this. How do you get them back to, if you want to do that, how do you prepare yourself being a college student? You may be able to submit a paper in three days in high school and score an A, but in college, you probably need three weeks to get ready to submit that paper. So this is where the class try to teach them the differentiating their habit before and after. And within here, we have our website, part of this program, right, age transition. So any of the group, congratulations, welcome. If you're transferred, this is for you. We know coming to a new campus can be overwhelming, so be prepared, and then we sign up. So one of your thing is talk to the students on your website. Use their voice. I understand where you're coming from. Any of this fit you, click on this. After they read, they should not have to scroll a second page to find what, what do I do next. You want to entice them at least in two areas. So here will be a sign up and then I give the syllabus and reserve your seat, the button clean enough, not distracting. And this is what is presented to them. Let me continue with this, why this data is important. So I said, let's pull up from the tutoring site, right? They collect all this data. When students come in, they sign 10 most tutored courses in the spring. They constitute 43% of the visit, that these are your classes. What are the patterns that you noticed? There are some English, there's some math. So the one that starts with zero are your developmental or remedial classes. They are required to come in because 20% of the class constitute additional tutoring, which was what? I propose to the faculty, have part of it, have them come in. So then at the end of the semester, we break down and say, oh, if you just look at the data, say, wow, we got 4,000 interaction. Does it mean good or bad or mean nothing? What do these classes tell me about the inclination to seek tutoring? Is it, does it matter? Or is it telling me what modality is more effective? There's so much more to it on the surface. Are these strong or weak tutoring services? I don't know. Are these good intervention for at risk? I don't know because I cannot tell. So look at the next slide. Same numbers, right? Now, if I break it down, a lot of students, freshmen, are coming in at 1,000 level. No wonder the English 1302, 130, right? Math 13, the 1,000 level, they are coming in. But what is the problem here? They are reducing as classes get harder and harder, fewer and fewer students are coming in for the 3000 level, 4000 level when they are getting into their major. Oh no, are we not having those classes, the subjects, are the tutors not effective? Are they not promoting in there? What is going on? Our 5000 level are our graduate students. So this is where you 
ask yourself then again out of this how do i know what they are coming in for right english math science history si session are they required good or what happened to the other subjects they are taking a lot more subjects uh chemistry your physics what happened so i align this and now i look at same data same data with the 10 most tutored out of the classes of D, F, and W rate, only three of those are the 10 because the remedial CMAT 0314 is required. So that's why the students are coming, but they're still struggling. So I pulled out at least 40% of the class who failed the course. Why are they not coming tutoring? Right. In other words, students, students who are coming tutoring are not necessarily the one who need to come. They are the gung ho. They are the one who took advantage of it. So, am I really reaching the at risk? Not sure. So then you go 1,000 level, 2,000 level, not coming in for history, 2322, right? Astronomy, uh, 1110, geology, all the classes right up here that they are failing, they are not coming for tutoring at all. And yet they are your 1,000 level, 2,000 level. Your freshman and your sophomore are not coming in. So what's going on? And then you go, hmm, look at my physics. Physics is one of those classes that is the first thing to enter STEM, right? And yet they are not coming. What does the research shows you? The STEM students are least likely to seek help because they often feel like if I'm in STEM, I'm supposed to be smart and not need help. So I shouldn't look like I'm weak and need help, but that's where they fall though. And I'm gonna show you more rates later. So that imposter syndrome is hidden and not being aware of them. So then, oh, let me look at the next, the next slide. Using that data from the fall now. So that was from the spring. So what was the fall before? When my physics, are the ones that are failing, 78%, right? So beside all of this, my top 40% is looking at this. If they are failing their classes, they are likely to need to repeat that class in order to enter their major. And yet they didn't come in tutoring at all. Five of the top DFW classes are not the top classes being tutored. Concern is about half the class that failed did not repeat or they chose to drop. They did not learn anything from tutoring or tutoring is not helpful. Uh, there are many variables, but it allows me to examine what is it that I need to do. So in framing A's is the intentional support out there. And they call it triangulated. Tutors, you cannot work alone. You need the advisors. And again, schools all have different structure for advising. But advisors and sure students, you are taking the correct classes in the correct sequence. And advisors need to be talking to tutors and tutors need to be talking to students. And then in communicating with faculty, which I'm gonna address next. So many schools have advisors, they don't talk to the tutors, right? And tutors don't talk to advisors. In fact, they do not talk to tutors, all advisors at all. So in here, what I have is I put together a team called the ACE Priority Team. They, they basically join forces to make sure that this group are talking and uh, being the, the layers on in between. If students are coming tutoring and they're at risk, so they basically target students who are at risk, and students are struggling, but they're gonna make it throughout the semester with the four checkpoints that we have. They want to let the advisor know is, don't drop this kid when they're going to come in and they want to drop and they're crying is work with us because they're going to make it the si shows that or the advisor have questions and say you know the student is struggling changing major and the tutors could say yes yeah, some of the most foundational knowledge are not there what is going on and the tutors are working with the faculty as si so they are communicating which i'm going to show you another slide how the other side work so of course the good model is having everybody communicate Sometimes we cannot catch it all, but if you have a good framework and allow them to communicate, we communicate through email, checks, or a, a platform, whatever platform you have, it gives you the notion, you know what? Rather than, yes, students write to drop, 
uh, students don't have to come to RIM, but what if we can merge these two groups to talk? We could get some information to help. So an example of intentional advising for at-risk students, they are to enroll in only 12 credits, uh, not 15. We call it lighter classes because we want them to make sure they establish their English history. And then a lot of time we have to put a math in there, but a lighter math. Uh, we avoid science. Uh, again, given whatever platform, science could be your thing in your institution. For ours, it's given the science that I just saw in the DFW, is to actually avoid that till the second semester when students get familiar with services and feel more confident about themselves, right? So you got to know your publish. We do not allow them to take online weekends or classes before 9 or 4 p.m. So it's particular there trying to find, so it also limits, right? Like this next spring semester, uh, we have to move it to 8.30. So then we go, if it has to be at 8.30 that we have to offer this class, what is the support we want to provide while they are registering to remind them these are the support services that you should be attending. Uh, remedial students, again, like I say, have a 20% stake. That means they go for additional hours of tutoring beyond their classes. So working with the faculty to understand, hey, we are on the same line, same same curriculum because if you ask an average student who come to read, what is it that you need help with what are they going to say i don't know this assignment they don't know what they don't know so you got to look at their notes and and teaching the tutors going well in the past lecture over this week what are notes that you have written let's organize this and then assessing them on based on these notes or instead of asking do you have any question based on what we just discussed in the last five minutes ask me something related to this formula or these steps within here. Explain to me. Provide an example or a non-example. If you were to move the numbers, what would it be, for example? So that is, again, teaching tutors how to assess and ask questions rather than any question. They always don't have questions. And so they came in here just for assignments and thinking that, oh, in the end, tutors are my copy editor. They're going to fulfill it. But they may not get, again, correct instruction, all of this information. Um, I got to move along here. Uh, it's 40 minutes. And also the other thing is intentional tutoring. So for example, I talk about SI that are attached to the faculty. So out of here is of the DFW classes that we're looking at, number of DFW without SI is 63. Why is it that these classes do not want an SI? How many didn't is the question. It's not how many they have. If these classes are failing, what is going on? Are they not helping? Are they not communicating? Are, you know, are the professors not understanding how to request an SI? Did they decline it? What is the reason for declining? We conduct survey each semester to find out how best they can work with them and provide faculty with workshop provide SI with workshop to help them better understand how we can provide data for them by sharing data. So we target the high DFW rate and discuss about students not just the contents. So we help create a class profile with uh, including not just for the class but four other classes that this student is taking that is affecting your class right? Every professor thinks their class is the most important class. No professor is going to say, well, sweetie, let's take care of your three other classes and don't worry about this assignment. No professor asks, well, what are all the other assignments that are due all at the same time? And we're not asking professors to shift their content or their syllabus, but we want them to understand if they are missing your class, they are likely missing their three or four other classes. So whatever we can help with this is also able to help them in the others. Right, finding out about uh, so each of my faculty in a freshman seminar or through the SI as much information as possible is basically finding out are they working, are they single parents, what was the GPA that they entered with, did they what was the grade of the prerequisite that they entered with? Is that a prerequisite? Are they repeating this class? Did they withdraw from this class previously? And they basically meet once a week uh, to find out from uh, the the uh, basically, let me slide here, to meet with the professor once a week uh, to find out and examine, first of all, how is the, you know, anything to close the gap in the teaching and what are some challenging factors. So within here, they form that three groups, right? The A group, fine, leave them alone. The B group, they're going to make it with the B or the C. And the C group is 
these are your at risk. So this is what every uh, tutors, uh, SI, communicate with the faculty to find out. And then they share the information also with the advisor. So this frequent visit of um, student missing class, not submitting assignment, attendance, and reaching out to the other classes as well, basically. So in terms of the services, I actually name it ACE for a reason. There was, there were, there was writing, there was uh, reading, there were different, you know, tutoring that I say through the eye of a student, it's confusing. Even if I come in for physics, maybe it wasn't physics, maybe it was reading that I need help with, right? So I reframe it instead of calling all these different centers, it's, it's called ACE. In other words, it's ACE. If you want to ACE yourself in class, you start with ACE by coming to ACE. And the telephone number is go for ACE or 4223 or see yourself graduate in four years or less by going to ACE. And so, and then open seven days a week. Those link, you know, uh, uh, lingua and promotional thing is what clicks with uh, people. So priming them is, we are always open, right? And during exam, three weeks before exam, we're open till midnight. So this is all part of helping you to become successful. And within the website, we talk to them as well. Um, let me see if I could move to this website. It's showing them, there's a self-help button. Oh, hang on, it's just shifted. There's a self-help button there for you. So it's not crowded, there's advising and tutoring. It's all part of it to help you, student resources. But there's some things in here that you could engage in by yourself. Meeting with a professor form, for example, is asking the same two questions. How am I doing in class in terms of handing in assignments? And, you know, I was absent at this time. This is what I've been doing. I went tutoring. What else can I do to close the gap? So there are instructions in there that are very simple forms that help them to understand how to help themselves. Even if they decide to change their major, it asks questions such as, what are the benefits? How does it affect you financially? Uh, how many credits will they say? How will it affect you in graduation? We teach them to teach themselves to take charge of their education. And in there, we also provide resources. For example, uh, hang on, let me get to the next page. On, for example, weekly check, right? Is put a check. So check yourself three times at least. You should have certain interaction with a professor, whether in the office hour, how to talk to the professor, are you reading before class, paying attention, taking notes, reviewing your notes? So they have a little checkpoint to say, you know what, I'm regulating myself. So this is a whole book, but I'm putting up this page for you to show you the different things in there, including sleep habits, including um, uh, interaction with an advisor, how do you choose a major, including uh, talking to career services. So there are different areas in there. Now I'm going to basically uh, go to the final slide here so you can ask questions. So when you say proactive is such a nice word, it's basically saying deliberate. I'm deliberately going out to look for this student. I'm very intentional. So what we talk about today is basically finding out who they are. Different groups have different needs. You cannot just throw a blanket in there. Let the data speak to you. Leverage on the media, talk to student with your website, not at student. Fill in this form. This is a guide for you versus fill in this form, fill in this form, fill in this form, right? So even as they go into tutoring, what did I learn today? What do I hope to achieve with my tutor? It's a very intentional form in all of this. And with that note, uh, this is the end of the presentation. I open up for any questions and discussion. Thank you for your time. Oh. All right, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hong. Um, Wendy so do does I. have a question. We have a couple of questions here that came in. Uh, Wendy's question is, who oh, should be tracing sorry. all these risks? Oh, can you hear me? Yes, I'm trying to close the slide or pull the slide. What do I, okay, can you see my oh, face I can just, uh, I, I can take you off, yeah, I can take you off screen okay. share. Like, Got it. Okay, let's, uh, yeah, let's see. Uh, oh, there we go. All right. Uh, so Wendy's question is, who should be tracing all these risk factors? It seems more like a counseling function than learning center faculty. Good question. Uh, I basically just pull it out. 
because when students check in tutoring, their data is already all there. And you have different pockets of people who can give you those information. Number one, your institutional assessment office have all of this data. The data was were all, always there, is who is the one who is asking the question? You need to ask the question, otherwise the data is just sitting in banner. I didn't create a new platform. It was always there, it's just that nobody asked. What if you say, pull up for me, Basically, I was looking to transfer and I said, pull up for me data of students who have 90 credits or more who have this GPA, et cetera. So uh, the office can pull up. Another thing is you can check your admission office, which, right, takes students who are transfer, or your at risk is basically who are coming tutoring. And from that alone, your office and uh, student support can do that. So different offices have different access to information, but this thing came from a very basic thing. Even if you just ask the question, who are coming to your tutoring support services when they check in? Start with that conversation. All right, great. Sorry, I was just answering somebody was asking about the recording. Uh, we will be sending that out within the next few days uh, for those of you who were late or unable to attend today. Uh, Charles asks, sometimes students seem, oh wait, uh, that wasn't the next question. We'll get to that one in just a second. Uh, let's see here. We've had a lot of questions come in just the last few seconds. Uh, all right, we'll get to Jessica's first. Uh, right now we are looking at high DFW courses and talking about how they might be supported uh, more with tutoring uh, or embedded tutors. Uh, what questions should we ask about those classes to be more in intentional in our interventions? So first of all, I feel like, you know, we know why they are failing, right? because they didn't come to class and they didn't hand in their assignments. And that's all the professor focused on. But, and then you go through the eye of the student. They did not sign up for a class and go, what can I do to fail today? What can I do to skip class? Something affected them. It could be transportation, homelessness, financial aid, bad day, broke up with girlfriend, whatever it is. is that is the opportunity for a conversation. So I don't know if I'm still allowed to show a screen. Can I still show my screen at all if I were to show you samples of something? Um, let me make you the presenter again. Let's, there so you go. Sorry. I'm going to give no, you I'm examples. So, and you're welcome to use this because it's on the website. Okay, uh, show my screen. Okay. So if I were to type in TAMU ACE, right, like rename it, your best thing is always to help students to help themselves. That is the key. If they can help themselves, it's half your better right there. Are you able to see my website? Okay, hang on, I'm gonna move this camera right here. Is that, um, uh, I just love academic achievement. Some question, think of it as a healthcare platform, like a, like a framework. You can feel information, if it's, you know, for bar, you don't want them to, it doesn't matter. What are the obstacles I'm experiencing? What do I want to talk to professor about? Identify my needs and challenges, follow through recommendation, reinforce what's working. If I say that, what are some talking points? Creating, trying to teach 200 people is harder. But what if I teach students? These are things that you could access, but again, of course, they have to identify I'm at risk, right, to begin with. But also if the advisors see, you know what? Something is already created, very easy. It's just literally, that's it, two page. Let's see, what are some things that we can talk about? You know, like you go to the doctor, you really go there for a headache, but then the doctor asks you 300 questions. I didn't think about it. I didn't think my family is related. This is where they think about, I don't know why I missed class, but you know what? It could be that I'm not, I'm not motivated. I don't have any peers to talk to. I don't have any friends. It has nothing to do with the class. So even if you could give the best tutors in physics, it was sense of belonging that they were struggling with. So the opportunity to communicate is opening up something. Like I said, this fits my campus. You could take this framework, and then what is it that we're gonna do? The goal. When a student reveals something, your job is not to be the counselor to fix all the problem. It's what can I do now to give the student, hey, I can do this for next week. I can do this in the next three classes. Very manageable. For them to think about four years of college, you basically think it's really just eight semester. And if you do summer, it's really just three semester, right? So let's think next week, not miss a single, uh, not miss a class in physics or 
attend tutoring for physics. Let's set up right now. And then let's see. So it's a simple thing. I tell you exactly where it is. Student get a copy. I get a copy. So this thing doesn't get submitted or anything. So now they get a copy and somebody's following up and it enters into the student's note in the file for our advisor. We encourage them. So every time you meet an at risk student, it's an opportunity to teach them and reteach them about resources. Because I can tell you, it's a lot harder to try to change infrastructure or wait for resources to fall off the roof for you. So there are, there are different layers that I'm trying to answer that I don't know if I answer some of those questions. Yeah. Oh, I think that was great. And um, Jessica, if you have any follow-up uh, questions about that, feel free to put that in the in the questions box. Um, but let's move on to Diana's question. She just wants to know what book was referenced with the checklist? Oh, so <laughs> this is a book that I created. And I go, you know what? We don't really have a... Uh, resource and yet we all know the solution is time management is going to class all of this question so i decided to take the uh you know uh summer to write a curriculum and uh it's called a map workbook my aspiration plan i can take charge of my education so it's a map basically and then you see the back page of it it has a map to teach them to get to graduation so basically is I just wrote this book and it's an e format, whatever. It start with their graduation. Start with the angle. You see your diploma and your name and your degree. If you don't know, it's okay. But you see a date projected. So in oh sorry, in, in here is I and I do a separate consultation for this. So people are welcome to, you know, contact me. But basically teaching them to become, you know, have a growth mindset, finding purpose, uh understanding where they are if you are failing in math and science and you hate math but my mom say i have to be an engineer you know what maybe 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 in 10 years i'm not saying it's not possible but given the evidence and a four year that's the vision for the entire my entire college's vision is four years graduation with two goals never missing a class and always handing assignments on time self-awareness self-regulation self-advocacy and self-empowerment and each of this is very practical teaching them the resources. So you will, you can always belong to another college, but you will always belong to university college. So asking the question, and then it becomes a very practical book that they do, finding a purpose. Where do I see myself? So this is just, you know, laying out uh, examples. Uh, so just, you know, let's say I, I can just flip through, but I just want to show you this is what I mean. Yeah, how to choose your major. So specific things like, uh, I have evidence of A and B in my past performance, or I have carefully studied the degree plan. Our students don't, they don't ever flip through it. And they go, you didn't tell me that this course was only offered once a year, or that I need to take five more math. Well, you need to study by yourself and know where to go from here. And then uh, important next step with the same goal, with this goal, I enter all my class schedule on my phone. I set an alarm on my phone, you know, and then uh, handing assignment. I will make an appointment to work with a tutor on at least one assignment each week. So they're basically learning to regulate themselves, how to read a syllabus. They have never seen a syllabus, you know, in high school. What are the information you look for? Other than, oh my gosh, it's like 40 pages. Uh, what does studying means? What's the difference between studying and learning, right? They are two different things. Am I studying enough? They are, in high school, it's, Oh, I'm done with my work and I submit. They don't understand. Each hour constitute how many outside hours of tutoring. And then this is where the page comes in. So these are just examples. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, and if you want more of this information, contact me directly so that I can help and consult with your institution. Yeah, okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, and we have a, another question. Uh, Edward asks, do you have any suggestions when it comes to helping bilingual students? Mm. So first of all, believe it or not, their needs are the same. The skill level is different. So think of it as we are more alike than we are different. So I identify it by group. Transfer students collectively have similar needs, and that's where you go from it. Dual enrollment students have different needs. Students with disability have different needs. So in other words, you got to ask yourself, bilingual, it's a strength 
Students who speak another language is a strength, not a disadvantage. I speak six languages. I don't have an American accent. I'm not a native speaker, but it's a gift. And I was taught to don't be ashamed of who I am. So first of all, the confidence of it's okay to articulate, to express yourself, to advocate for yourself, all of this. If they don't know who they are, they don't know what is it that they need. So their self-awareness is very important and that goes across the board. But for different group of students, bilinguals, I can express myself. Maybe I struggle in expressing it, then what do I need to do? I need to be more proactive by making sure that typical average student, which I have in this book says, takes three weeks to write this paper. And the professor will say that and the tutors will say that. And then help students to understand. In my case, is I probably need four weeks. So let me plan in advance and set my tutoring in time. And the tutors are aware. It's okay if students tell you, hey, I'm struggling, I'm a bilingual. Okay, let's work on a different framework. So they are okay with expressing who they are rather than be ashamed of who they are. I have a disability, I struggle in understanding abstract. Say it, they don't know, right? They often say, I need extra time. They tell all the time, extra time. If a kid has, sorry, if a student has, attention deficit, extra time could be the worst nightmare. Maybe it's breaking the assignment in two parts or being able to divide the math question in eight pieces so that I know how to follow a sequence. The formatting could be more helpful or having breaks is more helpful than give me extra one and a half time. So teaching them to know who they are, what is it that they are strength are, what are the areas of growth is more helpful. Yeah, I hope that helped one's answer. All right, thank you. And uh, we have a lot of questions. I don't know if we'll be able to get to okay, them all. Okay, I'll but, get um, through as fast as possible. <laughs> okay, uh, Charles says, uh, sometimes students seem to slowly shift from green to red. Are there any steps to stop this slide before it's too late? From green to red, yes. Is that, I'm back to that, that self-awareness. They often think, wow, if I made it through this, right? It's like, pff, it's a piece of cake, I can do it. What? I try to teach them is every professor is different. Everybody has a different standard, different requirement. So teaching them to self-regulate, you monitor yourself. So they have to do their self-check. Self-monitoring is a key. How am I doing so far by mid them, right? So if you go through that, am I doing this pattern? There is no secret formula. It's literally the amount of hours that you put in. So they could go, ah, oh, it's an art class. Believe it or not, our students fail art appreciation, pop music, and theater class. It's one assignment. So what is it that they fail in? They didn't show up and they didn't hand in their assignments. It's, so everything that leads them to not doing that is a distraction. So then it's teaching them to diagnose. Then I can monitor. Or as they are doing well, it's not neglecting them. You still provide them with all the resources by breaking down, make sure you monitor to maintain that A is what have you done that was effective? What have you done that was ineffective? Keep on checking yourself. And this is also available on uh, here, is that self-assessment, checking themselves constantly. So even though it says here it's for students who are not in good standing, anybody could use it, right? They don't need to submit to anybody, but it's basically teaching them, what am I doing that was ineffective and effective? Can I manage the time or manage the task? What's the difference between learning and studying? That's it. This is like the summation of all the things that they can track by themselves. So self-help is improvement. You don't have to be failing to improve yourself. All right. And next question from Bonnie. Can you explain more about what the remedial classes has 20% stake in tutoring on the intentional advising slide means? Okay. So in one of the interviews and research that I did uh, with the faculty and the students, for students who need remedial is the word developmental. And in special ed, it's called developmental disability. So that association with the word, I don't like it. I cannot change the catalog. So one of the things we did is we reframe. It's called design for excellence. It's still called DE. It's called design for excellence. So it teaches you to, sometimes you have to step back to propel, right? So um, it's the question about uh, the stake. So in other words, the mindset is, I am growing. Sometimes I need to step back in order to grow and project. So it's very important to frame that so that they don't see this as something embarrassing. And the stick is basically, is they meet Monday, Wednesday, and that Friday is the additional one tutoring. So then the tutor 
work with the students very strategically. It's like an essay in the class. And but now it's, it's not a professor, but then we will talk to the professor, but very intentional. It's a one to one with them that they come in and working on what is it. So it's not just because twice a week, remember, they struggle in regulation. They don't know that just two hours. How, I, how am I going to make up 12 years of something you miss in 14 weeks? I cannot. So additional. In fact, we have a 66 percent. Uh, they excel. And I show them the result. I show students, if you come in at least five out of the 11 times that you, you know, you come in, uh, more than 66% got a C and more than 78% got a B. So I show them the data. Look at the evidence. You just come in tutoring and it helps. So I, I share that data with them and it's up to them. I offer virtual, I offer weekend. There is no reason to not come in or to not partake in that. Yeah, it's 20% at stake. So they learn to, it's okay to ask for help, even even after I pass my remedial, continue using. So I want them to get addicted to it. And every students are allowed to book one month in advance the same tutor that they are familiar with. Okay. Uh, and uh, next question from Karen, I, I don't know how much more time we have left, but uh, I have what is if you want to okay. say? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Karen asks, what is the difference between intentional advising and SI leaders? Are they performing the same function? So first of all, advising are advisors for class scheduling and uh, services, all of this. Okay. And then SI are attached to a professor in that singular class to do with specifically that assignments in that class. So as I have done that class with the professor, often recommended by the professor, they got A or B in that class and they, they are good. Now let me help the students because I took this last semester. So advisors are communicating with them. That's what the key is, the communication part. So if you don't have a platform, use an email. You know, students is, so and so is trying to drop the class. Can you give me a gauge on how the students are doing? Finding out information before you drop them, even though they have a right to drop it. Is that what you're asking? I'm just wondering. Um, I think so. Um, if uh, that was from... if not, I can address more. Yeah, sure. Uh, okay. And Elizabeth asks, I have heard professors tell students to go to the to the tutoring center and they will fix your essay. Uh, how do you think students mm. interpret that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, as a, I get that as a, a lot. As a former writing yeah. center person, I, uh, I cringed. Yeah. <laughs> so it's okay. You know what? Let's say you can change everybody and, and, and however they come in is let me help you transform. Let me, you know, help you. What question is that you ask? So we teach the tutors. It's not just an assignment. We are not an editorial. We are like, what else? So for example, what is the proactive thing I can do? You know what? I bought Grammarly for everybody. So make sure all freshmen, the first time you come in, whatever part of the transition program, sign on. So clean up all of this first because in 30 minutes, I cannot fix your paper. I'm not a fixer. Is that, and each of them, we have an action form is that they make the next appointment. Next appointment. So it's like, it's like you go to the dentist, you make the next appointment, even though, are you free six months from now? Well, I don't know if I'm free six months from now, but they put it in anyway. So we make sure that it's very intentional. Your next appointment is this, and we are going to review this, discuss with your professor and ask questions this. And our tutors also, you know, put out syllabus, asking questions, all of this. But we want the students to be the advocate and ask for that question. But again, we use a form and, and somebody go, okay, so I have to plan on coming back for more. I need to see you three more times uh, to completely, you know, uh, for example, help you with this uh, assignments. So they make the assignments. But first step is getting them there is a good thing. Getting them is a good thing. Congratulations. Celebrate. Absolutely. Uh, Melissa asks, how do you recruit people to sign up for ACE? Do students voluntarily sign up and do at-risk students sign up? Uh, number one, we get from the registrar, who are the students? And then we have flyers, we have banners, it's priming. You got to make it visible because they're not going to ask, huh, I come here and I'm going to sign up. Everything else is called orientation. The fun part, the leadership, the food, academics is often missing. So we go through the registrars, we target them. The minute you're admitted, we send a message out to you, email, social media, and then we tell them to bring three other friends doesn't matter whether they're transferred or not. Bring three other friends, 
to learn this because every semester something is different, right? Whether, hey, let's review again. Oh, I didn't know that. I have a student who had been here for 192 credits and never once knew that she can go talk to the counselor that there's counseling on campus. So let the friends be the pressure for the friends. You know what, if you're gonna go to Starbucks, let's go together. So I put everywhere, whether it's the toilet, whatever it is, the flyer has to be attractive. That means one glance. Okay, if it's one toilet sitting and it's on the door, I gotta go one glance. The C is, hey, this sounds like me. I need to go. If you wanna get ahead, get it. So you gotta have publicity to sell them what this thing is. And then everything else is we offer virtual, we offer online, we offer weekend. There is no way to say no. Awesome. <laughs> um, this next one uh, is from Ash, who is a tutor. Uh, they say, it was really helpful when you said we can say, ask me a question about what we talked about in the past five minutes instead of, do you have questions about that? Uh, so thank you for that. And uh, they asked, do you have other tips for strategies tutors can use to get students more engaged in tutoring sessions? So all of those words, more engaged, is I cannot measure and I cannot see. So it got to be very specific. So ask yourself or your group, what is it that you're trying to accomplish? If we, so we offer different programs. Let's say part of the thing is we use our A's to celebrate uh, uh, Hispanic Month. Visibility, you kept talking about it, talking about it, talking about it. And uh, having their friends celebrate it. My next goal is to make sure a scan, a, a QR code is on every desk such that, you know what, I better scan and make an appointment right now because it's coming up. Such that it's visible everywhere. So first of all, physically, all of that. And then what is it that they do? It must be worthwhile. Am I there yet? No, because as I look at the 3,000, 4,000 level, it's still not there yet, right? So you want to make sure what is it that are coming is so much more than just chemistry. It's study skill. It's time management. We offer you so much more. So in other words, is that we put in here as what are the different resources that we can teach you. So this website is still in the in the process, and I would say ACE priority is you can ask anything. You can ask, and then we talk about hey, you want to extend time. So nothing here tells you I'm in trouble. That's why I go tutoring. We offer individualized academic support uh, beyond regular tutoring. Basically, it's for at risk, but we call it you are a priority. And then we use the same priority registration, right? It's like, hey, select group. So the terms is very important. They see themselves as, I am not in trouble. I can use these resources. So everything is this page. Keep coming to this page. Ask questions, and we keep building. We are still at this point of building. Uh, student resources and building our own little Khan Academy, but it's very deliberate on the classes. It's very specific to that class, the assignments and things like that, that they prep themselves and then they have professors and then they have tutors. So it's very intentional with each of them. But start with your DFW and then go from how do you teach your tutors to ask questions, to check for assessment and what do they do when they walk out? Got to have at least one action a comeback and an assignments, right? What is it that they're coming back for? Get them addicted to tutoring. <laughs> um, and we've had a couple of questions, a couple of people asking uh, if they could get copies of the Academic Achievement Plan and the the, the ebook yeah. and everything. You can download um, here, but okay. the ebook is copyright. However, I'm let's say I will have more information to talk to you if you are happy to do that. Okay. And, uh, yeah, basically, okay. you guys know all that. I just put it all in one book. <laughs> okay, and when but we send out the recording, yeah. we'll send out. Um, we'll send out if if you're okay with it, Dr. Hong. We'll send your. We'll include your email address if people have follow up questions. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And uh, and any other information. Um, so, uh, let me see. Um, oh, Diana asks, how is this workbook taught? Uh, to is it taught to tutors or faculty? Uh, and she wants to confirm that you said it was. Did you say it was a two week course? Uh, several things. This workbook, first of all, is available for anybody at any level. Intentionally, it is taught through the UNIF class, that means the freshman who comes in. It's a whole class of uh, two credits class that they have. And every uh, and then the transitional program is a, are, are you able to see my slides there? here? You'll find that this yes. course syllabus is part of it. The course, it looks like a syllabus, but is a, a bridge version of that, but in two weeks. 
right? So then down here, under here, this is another, hey, it's a form, but smaller. So they have version of this everywhere. Every tutors, every advisors around the whole campus knows what the MAP workbook is. Every peer mentor knows. So I train them personally. And again, it's a self-paced, self-help book. If you just follow the book, it's, it's basically just talk to you, right? It's, it's basically just talking to you. So um, yeah, see everything here yeah, is you could you could do it yourself. How how is it right? Talking to the professor, what are questions I should ask? Uh, frequently asked questions. What happened? How do I improve the GPA? You get an F. You need to improve your GPA. What? Well, duh! I know that, but you don't keep throwing the kid back in the pool and say, you know what? You gotta learn to swim. You are drowning. You are drowning. You either gonna give them a float, you put them in a sh shallower pool, you gotta give them some skill, you teach them not to panic. So this is what it's all about, right? You teach them not to panic. So what does it mean by if you drop, you withdraw? So I basically is, a lot of it is gonna be uh, online, but basically it's just talking to them in their words. So no complicated words, right? It's basically is talking to them in their own words. Yeah, so if your GPA falls, so I'm talking to you, not talk at them. Okay. Okay. All right. And I think that is all the questions we had. Oh. Uh, we had a couple others about sharing documents and things like that. But again, um, any documents that uh, Dr. Hong is able to share, we will share those. And if uh, there's anything else you want to see, uh, you can email her and we will include that in the recording uh, with the recording as well. So I want to turn my camera back on. Uh, thank you, everyone, for, for being here today. Thank you, Dr. Hong, for your, the generosity of your time and your expertise. Um, um, we are so uh, we are so excited to have had you today and uh, for those of you uh, who are still with us again if you could take that survey that you'll be redirected to once you leave and uh, I hope everyone has a great rest of your week thank you so much for joining us mm -hmm.